On July 2, 1934, Crescent Lake Bible Camp opened its first season of Christian camps for young people. This camp was the dream of Arthur Perkins, a Presbyterian minister from Merrill, Wisconsin. Located at Crescent Lake near Rhinelander, Wisconsin, this was his dream of a camp that would be accessible and affordable to young people, but also of a camp that would preach the Word of God, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ from the scriptures without compromise. This camp was not without controversy. In fact, in 1935, charges were brought against Reverend Perkins for his involvement here at this camp. A trial was held, a conviction was secured, and a censure was brought against him. We are here at Crescent Lake Bible Camp for a conference examining the life and legacy of this remarkable servant of Jesus Christ. In our conference, there are seven lectures and four sermons written by Reverend Perkins, delivered by me, Reverend Brian DeYoung, the pastor of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. This conference is the production of the archivist and historian of the Presbytery of Wisconsin and Minnesota of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church done in conjunction with our good friends from WVCY-TV and with the help of the Crescent Lake board and staff. Good morning and welcome back to our conference on Arthur Perkins, looking at his life and legacy. I'm Pastor Brian DeYoung, the archivist and historian of the Presbytery of Wisconsin and Minnesota of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Today we're going to talk about Art Perkins and his work as the field director of Winnebago Presbytery. During the first three decades of the 20th century, the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America had a thriving presence in the state of Wisconsin. In the 20s and 30s, there were five PCUSA presbyteries in Wisconsin, Chippewa, Madison, La Crosse, Milwaukee, and Winnebago. Both Chippewa and Winnebago presbyteries had 63 congregations. Milwaukee had 41 churches, Madison had 31 churches, and La Crosse had 21 congregations for a total of 219 PCUSA congregations in the state of Wisconsin. That is amazing. That is a wide and deep presence. In the northeastern quadrant of the state was the Winnebago Presbytery. And within the bounds of that presbytery were numerous significant cities. Green Bay, Wausau, Merrill, Stevens Point, Appleton, Oshkosh, and Fond du Lac. And then there were many smaller towns and villages as well, such as Marshfield, Stratford, Gleason, Crivets, Annaway, Hogarty, Abbotsford, Wyawaga, Winnicani, Buffalo, and my favorite, Viefkind. In early 1927, the pastors of the leading established churches in the Winnebago Presbytery unanimously agreed to hire Arthur Perkins to serve as the field director for their home mission churches. When their proposal was presented to the Synod of Wisconsin Administrative Council, it received unanimous approval. A presbytery field director was something like a regional home missionary in my own denomination. He worked under the direct oversight of the presbytery's National Mission Committee. And that committee was responsible for home missions, for church planting, and for church extension. 
The field director was directly responsible to the chairman of that home missions, the National Missions Committee, as well as reporting on a regular basis to the administrative council of the synod. The field director would be responsible for the many small rural churches in the 24 counties of Winnebago Presbytery. He would provide pastoral support and care for their pastors and wives, as well as doing any other duties that the presbytery happened to assign to him. In the years leading up to Perkins' appointment as field director, the National Mission Churches of Winnebago had been largely neglected. Most of the men serving in the pulpits of those churches were not seminary trained. According to Perkins' close friend and co-worker, the Reverend Ernest Tremblay, who had served for over 25 years as one of these home mission church pastors, most of his colleagues in those years were of inferior quality. The presbytery relied very heavily upon lay workers who were not trained or ordained. Furthermore, the performance of previous field directors had been underwhelming. In a protest that was lodged concerning the conviction of Arthur Perkins at his trial and signed by Tremblay and 21 other presbyters, the protesters described Perkins' field work as follows. In efficiency and results, surpassing that of any field worker in our presbytery for the last 25 years. That assessment only highlights Perkins' effectiveness in this role. Now, to better understand the service of Art Perkins as field director of Winnebago, we will examine his work under the following headings. Recruitment, evangelism, preaching and pastoral ministry, administrative ministry within the churches, ministerial care, and then work among the youth. Arthur Perkins reported that when he arrived to start his work, a good number of the pulpits of these churches were vacant, and it was Perkins' job to recruit men to take these assignments. Now, that was not an easy task, since most seminary graduates were very reluctant to take a call to a rural situation that afforded only a modest salary. Understandably, the presbytery preferred men who had been reared in Presbyterian homes, who had been trained at Presbyterian colleges and seminaries, and ideally were lifelong members of that denomination. Such men would more readily understand the finer points of the denomination, and they would be able to function seamlessly within that ecclesiastical setting. But there's another side to this. Men who are trained in PCUSA seminaries, such as McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago, would have been exposed to the theological currents and cross-currents of that era, especially to the more progressive view that was called modernism. Modernism was really a blend of theological liberalism, German higher criticism, and Darwinian evolution. The modernists had an unshakable belief in the march of society toward a golden age. It was their own version of postmillennialism, which was fully compatible with Darwinian evolution. Nevertheless, despite the difficulty, Perkins traveled repeatedly to Chicago to meet with students at McCormick in order to recruit them to come to the fields. 
He also visited the Presbyterian Seminary in Omaha, Nebraska on another recruiting trip. And through various avenues, including his monthly field director reports, which were published in a magazine called the Wisconsin Presbyterian, Perkins appealed to men to come and fill these vacant spots. Despite his tireless efforts in recruitment, the vacancies continued to be a problem. Perkins was very reluctant to bring a man to a rural church whose orthodoxy was questionable. To fill the void, Perkins was willing to consider graduates of the Moody Bible Institute from which he himself had graduated. These Moody men were theologically trustworthy and evangelistically oriented. However, their educational attainments did not always measure up to the PCUSA expectations and requirements. Most Moody graduates were fundamentalists, and they did not have a particularly strong commitment to the church, especially to the PCUSA. One of these men was Kay Fenton. Kay was a pastor of one of these churches. He was also involved in the work of the Crescent Lake Bible Camp. His wife, Carrie, writing in her book, The Costly Dream, relates a particular conversation. Kay said, These are little mission churches struggling in a poor part of the state. Don't you remember what Reverend Perkins, the National Missions Director, told us in his letter? It's nothing to boast about in a financial way, but if a man is looking for a chance to win souls and build up believers, it is unlimited. There are many fine young people to work with. I remember best what he said about you, Kerry commented, how he needed another man who believed the old book and preached salvation to sinners through the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. His very words were, I was impressed with your quiet way at Moody and always honored you. On more than one occasion, a Moody graduate would be brought into a small, struggling rural church. Through his diligent ministry, over years, he would build up the congregation. When the congregations were larger, they could afford to pay a higher salary. And when that happened, some in the presbytery tried to push the Moody men aside and bring in McCormick graduates to take their place. This effort caused no little friction with the churches and with their pastors. Well, by the conclusion of his time as field director, after seven years of work, Perkins could report that all of the churches were supplied with capable and faithful ministers. Next, we want to look at evangelism. From the very beginning of his ministry, Arthur Perkins loved evangelism. During his pastorate at North Milwaukee Presbyterian Church, he frequently participated in evangelistic campaigns. One report is especially revealing. <clears throat> the Wisconsin Presbyterian, this publication of the Administrative Council of the Synod of Wisconsin reported as follows. Reverend Arthur Perkins, pastor of North Milwaukee Church, held a two-week series of meetings in the Couderay Church with blessed results. Now, Couderay is in the far northwestern part of the state. It's really a small town in the middle of nowhere. The attendance and interest were large from the start, and the power of God was early manifest in the services. Twenty-nine members were received into membership at the close, most of them by confession of faith and baptism. The entire community has been richly blessed, 
and we wish it were possible for Reverend Perkins to conduct similar services in many of our fields. So the Administrative Council is saying, this is perhaps our foremost evangelist, and his ministry in evangelizing a small town in northwest Wisconsin bore tremendous results. We wish he could be in all of our areas. Now, when Perkins arrived in Winnebago as the field director, he discovered a lack of any serious evangelistic work. In his final report as field director, Perkins looked back and recalled the situation. He says, when I came, very little was done in the line of evangelism. The first year, I gave 22 weeks to that work. I soon realized that it would be impossible for me to carry on administrative work and the evangelistic effort at this rate, so I was led to organize the missionaries and pastors of the village and rural churches into cooperative meetings. For the past six years, from 25 to 30 of our churches have had such meetings. So they would have a week in Crivets, and they would bring in three of the rural pastors. And then they would have a week in Winnicani, where three other rural pastors would come in. And they would just rotate around and have these evangelistic weeks in all of the various fields where they had churches. Now he goes on in 1931 to report. I have conducted evangelistic meetings of one week each in the following communities, Lily, Humboldt, Long Lake, White Lake. I spent two weeks preceding Easter at Keel in Milwaukee Presbytery. This was the first effort of any church in Keel ever trying a series of weeknight meetings. The results were very gratifying. There was an average of 90 attending every night for 11 nights, several united with the church. Can you imagine that today? Having two weeks of these weeknight meetings where there's preaching, evangelistic preaching, and you're having 90 people come out every night for these meetings. He goes on in that 1931 report, I spent 40 weeks in evangelism. My contract calls for a day each week for myself and one month each year vacation. My daily report will show that I still have 123 days or about four months, which I might have taken for myself but was spent in the work of the presbytery and the church. He didn't really take much vacation. And sometimes he used his vacation to go to another community to conduct evangelistic services for them. This man loved evangelism. He breathed and lived evangelism. He also engaged in personal evangelism with individuals and families. One example was the Stevenson family who lived near Merrill. And one of the Stevenson children, Joanne, who I had the privilege of interviewing, told me about how Reverend Perkins just showed up at their farm one day. He had no previous connection to the family. They were nominal Lutherans, but they really didn't attend church. So he came and he shared the gospel with the family. And together they knelt down in their living room and they prayed to the Lord for salvation. Mr. Stevenson later became an elder in the Merrill Church. And he served and helped his pastor, Arthur Perkins, through the ordeal of the trial and the appeal. Ernest Tremblay testifies to Perkins' evangelistic zeal in that tribute, which we looked at earlier. 
But listen again to these words. Mr. Perkins was a winner of souls. There will be many stars in his crown. Called by God from behind the plow, he never lost sight of his calling as being that of winning souls. He was evangelical and evangelistic and a fire with zeal and enthusiasm for the salvation of the lost. He was a fisher of men in season and out of season. In spite of much professionalism in the ministry, social gospel in many pulpits, and endless schemes of men in the church to reform a lost and hopeless world, my friend kept on doing the work of an evangelist in pointing all men to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. There's one other aspect of his evangelistic ministry that is worth noting, and that is his work among the American Indians around Gresham, Wisconsin. There was a PCUSA church that was there, but it was full of liberalism and modernism. The Indians were not satisfied with what they were hearing from the pulpit of that church. So with the help of one of his elders, Harold Hillegas, Art traveled to Gresham from Merrill between 1930 and 1935 to do regular and intensive evangelistic and discipleship work among the Indians. And his work among them was greatly effective and very much appreciated by those Indians. In fact, some of them later became part of the group that formed the OPC congregation in Gresham, Wisconsin. And so he was very much ahead of his time, not only ministering to people like himself, but going cross-cultural to the American Indians that also needed the gospel. So he was an evangelist at heart. Another aspect of his work as field director involved preaching and pastoral ministry. Although he did not serve a single congregation in his capacity as field director, he engaged in a significant amount of preaching and pastoral ministry. In that 1931 report to the Presbytery, he says that during that four year period, he preached 749 sermons, made 2,776 pastoral calls, baptized 272 persons, conducted 137 personal spiritual interviews, moderated 267 session meetings, moderated 159 congregational meetings, and received 519 members. Now those numbers average out as follows. 15 sermons per month, 58 pastoral calls per month, six baptisms per month, three personal spiritual interviews per month, over five session meetings per month, three congregational meetings per month, and 11 new members per month. Now just think about those numbers. 15 sermons per month on average. Now most pastors of local congregations preach perhaps eight to 10 sermons per month. I myself preach two sermons per week. Perkins preached almost four sermons per week. He also conducted 58 pastoral calls per month. That's almost 15 pastoral calls each week. And likewise, three personal spiritual interviews per month. It's an almost unbelievable volume of ministry. If he were doing nothing else but that, you would say his plate is full to overflowing. But this is just one part of his multifaceted ministry. 
Now also found in those statistics is the number of session meetings and congregational meetings that Perkins conducted. Here we come to what I am calling administrative ministry, the moderating of meetings. Early on in his tenure as field director, the presbytery appointed Art Perkins to be the moderator of all of the sessions and congregations of the vacant churches. And for this reason, he was responsible for moderating session meetings and congregational meetings. And during the first four years of his service as field director, he moderated over five session meetings per month and three congregational meetings per month, each and every month. Now, to give some perspective, I moderate one session meeting per month and typically one congregational meeting per year. And that's not unusual. These meetings take time and require preparation. And then Perkins would need to travel to and from the churches where these meetings took place. Consider that a session meeting could take two hours. And then you add travel on both ends. That's going to eat up a whole evening or a whole afternoon. It must have consumed a very large amount of his time. And so moderating five session meetings and three congregational meetings each and every month would be a very serious undertaking. Now again, we extract that and say, if that is the only thing he's doing, that's a heavy load. But it's not. In fact, this is one of the less significant things he's doing. In the area of ministerial care, Perkins had responsibility for the pastors and their wives in these rural churches. And he initiated two programs in order to care for them. One of those programs was a system of circles where pastors and their wives in a particular region or area of the presbytery would have monthly meetings for fellowship and encouragement. They rotated hosting responsibilities so that it never became too burdensome on one particular family. And whenever he was able, Perkins attended these fellowship circles. The second initiative is even more impressive in my opinion. This is the annual village and rural pastors conferences that were held for the pastors and their wives. Now he described these conferences in his report to Presbytery. We have also held a village and rural pastors conference each year for the past five years. These gatherings have given the men and their wives an opportunity to get together for inspiration and a practical discussion of their common problems. A number of our former pastors and missionaries have written telling us how much these monthly and annual meetings meant to them. At the annual conferences, Perkins planned programs covering a wide range of topics both theological and pastoral. And then he would ask various pastors to come in and speak on these different topics. And he always left plenty of room for discussion and interaction within the group. So let me give you a list of some of the topics they covered in these rural and village pastors' conferences. Time management for the pastor. Pastoral calling, what it is, what it does, and its difficulty. Financing church budgets. What the field man expects from pastors and vice versa. Stewardship. Pastoral problems. Church publicity and advertising. Evangelism. Christian education, summer Bible schools, 
the Holy Spirit, the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the ministry, how a minister may grieve the Holy Spirit, the second coming of Christ, the second coming and the Jews, what to do until Christ comes, the church, her identity, her promises and assurances, her work. And the last one is just sweet, why the church can never fail. These are theological, these are practical, the sorts of things that a pastor in a rural church might wrestle with, and things to edify his own soul and build up his own ministry. Finally, Perkins always maintained a keen interest in the youth of the church. And to that end, he pioneered a fellowship network for the youth of the regional church. He reports that, believing that the youth of our churches would drive to good things as well as bad, I was led to plan and develop with the assistance of the pastors, monthly meetings for fellowship. We have held about 30 such meetings with an average attendance of about 150 at each meeting. 150 youth getting together for these meetings to have teaching, fellowship, encouragement. Listen again to Ernest Tremblay's assessment on this point. Mr. Perkins was a friend of children and young people. Both as a pastor and as a field man, he was ahead of his generation in successful work among them. He organized youth as few men can, and hundreds of them can testify to the spiritual blessings received under his ministry or due to his leadership. He knew how to meet their needs, both socially and spiritually, and led many to Christ and Christian service. One organization that he especially promoted was called Christian Endeavor. It was a Christian youth organization. He saw the value of young people being involved in a group of their own, with oversight and encouragement from himself as pastor. It was through Christian Endeavor that young Les Dunn received valuable training which would serve him very well in his decades of pastoral ministry in the OPC. The last thing I would point out about his time as field director is the amount of travel that he put in. In his report at the end of his fourth year, he stated that he had traveled 123,749 miles. That breaks down to 2,578 miles per month, or an average of 644 miles per week. Some of this he traveled by train, some of it by automobile. According to figures supplied at the conclusion of his seven years, the cost for his ministry broke down to about two cents per mile traveled. And again, for comparison's sake, I keep a monthly log of my own travel, and there are some months where it can be very heavy and I can have over a thousand miles that month. 2,500 miles per month of travel. It's just remarkable. While such diligent and faithful service should have earned Perkins the enduring gratitude of his entire presbytery, such was not the case. Despite his sacrificial service for them, a number of his fellow ministers resented his theological conservatism and his effectiveness in his work and they actively sought to oust him from their midst. Their chosen battleground for this fight was the Crescent Bible Camp Project, which we will examine in our next session. Thank you.
Well, thank you for your attention to this video and this conference. I trust that it has been of spiritual encouragement and help to you, and that it has given you some historical data that you were not aware of. There will be a biography of Arthur Perkins forthcoming. The title is Standing Against Tyranny, The Life and Legacy of Arthur Perkins. I am the author, and it will be published through Amazon.com. Lord willing, we will also have an audiobook available for that. For information, please contact me, Brian DeYoung, at Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church, 4930 Green Valley Lane, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, 53083. Thank you.